Hello, you are listening to the Keto Answers Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin, and joining me this week is Dr. John Lemansky. Dr. Lemansky focuses on doing a lot of work in the ketogenic space. He is known as the Keto Doctor, so he, clearly he spends a lot of time in that arena, but he also focuses a lot in his population and his practice on biohacking. And so what does that mean if you're not familiar? It just means that measuring a lot of different things in your body and how you interact with the environment to optimize your health. And so we dig into all of his uh, tips and tricks that he uses with his patients, all the things that he measures and how he optimizes all the health for the patients that he does have. So there's going to be a lot of information in this one, um, some about the ketogenic diet, but a lot more about optimizing other things in your health. So prepare to learn a little bit more than just about nutrition in this episode and plug in and I hope you enjoy. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to chat about our sponsor, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto is all about making a ketogenic diet healthy and accessible. Whether you're reading all of our online guides or articles or enjoying Perfect Keto's exogenous ketones or any other keto-friendly products, everything you need to make keto work for you is at perfectketo.com. I know what you're thinking. Hey, aren't you the founder of Perfect Keto? Yep, that's right. And all of my insanely high standards have been put into making each and every product. My background as a functional medicine clinician helps me craft the cleanest and healthiest possible products and best information about a ketogenic diet. Head on over to perfectketo.com to learn anything you need to know about the ketogenic diet. And if you've never tried any of our products before, feel free to use the code Keto Podcast for 20% off your first order. With that being said, let's get into the show. Doc, thanks for coming on the show today. It's great to be here. It's really a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, super excited to get you on as you dive really, really deep into obviously using a ketogenic diet. Uh, I think you're the the keto doctor is how people know, know you. It's pretty, well. it's pretty subtle. Uh, um, but... Um, also into a lot of different methods and in, in how people can optimize their life through things like biohacking rather than just going by a standard of care. Um, what has this path been like for you as you train as an MD? Um, what does that look like out of school to kind of where you are now? Like, where are the high points that have kind of changed your direction? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a kind of a fun journey, I think. Um, you know, we think of medicine. So obviously I was trained internal medicine as a MD and, you know, traditional path as you go and you do traditional medicine in a clinic or a hospital. Um, I've always been really kind of interested in human performance. I was a kind of a pseudo athlete and um, did a lot of triathlons, a lot of running, cycling. And so I was always pushing my body um, to the limit and trying to understand kind of metabolism and, and how to really optimize myself. But what really drove me to kind of change directions is I actually, after residency, went to Mississippi to work as a hospitalist. And I went there because it was really the sickest part of the country. And I wanted to, I was idealistic. I wanted to make a change within the system. And what I saw there was both life-changing and as depressing as you can imagine, because here it is where 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds are on dialysis or really at end of their life in their 20s. And that is all due to nutrition and lifestyle. Um, and the amount of people that I saw like that really kind of uh, was eye-opening. And so I started transitioning more to trying to be preventative. So the kind of the Western way of uh, doing medicine, we're very, very good at after the fact. So if you get into a car accident, you get a heart attack, a stroke, you definitely want to be in the United States or, or you know, a first world country. But we're not very good at preventing all those things. And obviously, all the studies that we look at, the markers of diabetes are, are going exponential. So for me, it was really kind of a blessing in disguise to be exposed to the reality of medicine and health in America in the, in the poorest, sickest part of the country. Um, so from then, I basically – I had been doing a ketogenic lifestyle for myself. I had been doing biohacking because – to me, science is fascinating and the way that our body really interacts with different aspects of the environment is, is to me, fascinating. Um, so I was always kind of tinkering on myself, but we, we've we come to a time where we have so much data, but we have the ability to actually interpret what that data means. And so biohacking at this point is really something that we can focus on and see what the difference is in our body based on on what changes we make. And so that's kind of, in a nutshell, the kind of circular pathway I took to becoming more of a preventative uh, doctor focusing on that. So how, how did it go as far as clinical practice for you? Did you kind of start your own thing right out of the gate? Did you, did you switch around? How many, like, what does your experience look like there dealing with patients? 
Yeah, so I, I worked as a hospitalist. So basically what that means is if you get admitted to the hospital, um, there's a doctor there 24-7 taking care of you. Um, what I saw there, though, was repeat of the same thing over and over again and the same people coming back because – it's almost like a Band-Aid approach. So we are very good. We get people on medications um, of which, you know, the studies look at that and say, well, at best, maybe 50% of the people are going to take the medications you prescribe. And why is that? Well, because we're prescribing so many medications on different circuits, uh, different time schedules. So it's just, there's the lack of communication. Plus, you and I kind of have realized that we can avoid a lot of these medications by doing simple things, by changing our nutrition, changing kind of our lifestyle. And so little by little, people started approaching me and saying, hey, you look different. You're doing things differently. You're talking about things differently. Would you help me? And so it was really kind of a grassroots um, effort where I wasn't even really thinking, hey, I should go in this direction. But as I started noticing uh, making a dramatic difference in people's lives, really taking them off, you know, medications that I knew would um, lead them in a path that they would be sicker um, pretty early on in their life and seeing the dramatic changes in people, not only from a weight perspective, but just getting off medications, how they felt, their understanding of food and nutrition and lifestyle and the effects on them was like dramatic. Um, and so little by little, I started building a practice with, um, people that, you know, word of mouth basically. Um, and people will listen to you as a physician because number one, you can present the, the data and say, look, here's what the data shows. Here's the experience. Here are the labs we're going to track. Here are the markers we're going to track. And they're going to see, okay, not only is there science behind this, but there's also a way to track progress beyond just weight as like the end all be all goal of success. Um, mine's a little bit different because I do more of a virtual care. So I actually go see, uh, patients that I take care of, um, in different States in the country. And so in a way it's kind of a cool way to do it because with the advent of technology and everything being basically virtual, I can, uh, kind of scale and see more people in different parts of the country and hopefully kind of plant a seed in different areas so that, what I've noticed is that once I kind of help one person, their friends start noticing, Hey, what are you doing differently? Because you look much better. You seem better, you're healthier. And so it kind of spreads the message in parts of the country that maybe will not get the message like in, you know, San Francisco or New York or Miami, like big cities. That's an interesting approach. And then how did you change from kind of this grassroots model to looking at biohacking? And if you want to explain that for people who don't know maybe what that term is or entails. Yeah, so biohacking is kind of coming around to where it's becoming popular, and there's a couple of guys out there that are really pushing the envelope, like Asprey and, and Greenfield, and kind of bringing it to the masses. But it's kind of disruptive in everything that we do. Our sleep patterns are disrupted by technology. We're working, you know, much longer hours. We're not exercising. Our nutrition not very good. And so, if you actually look at the human body and metabolism, all those different aspects of life really impact your ability to be healthy. So beyond nutrition, you know, take somebody who's never slept very well or has had a baby or is working as a night shift worker and tell them, hey, you know, try to control your appetite. You're not going to be able to do that because you're basically going against hormonal changes in terms of cortisol and uh, stress hormones that are going to really impact your ability to be healthy. And so you have to address beyond just nutrition. Having said that, though, you know, a low carb ketogenic way of eating is definitely, in my opinion, the root of success. But it's more than that. It's you got to address stress. You got to connect with people. You have to get light exposure. Basically, you have to do everything we've told you not to do uh, for the last 50 years to get healthy. Got it. And, and so we were chatting a little bit before the recording that you have a kind of interesting next few years plan out for you. Um, what does that entail and why are you going on this little journey? Yeah. So a couple of things that I'm really uh, focused on. So I have three little children and what I've seen in our country and really around the world is the rise in obesity in children and diabetes and all the metabolic syndromes that are associated with it. And so one of my goals is to expose my children to different parts of the country and different parts of the world and show them 
and show people that we go to, how do you actually get healthy? How can you actually implement kind of a, a real food diet in different parts of the country based on whatever they can grow? So for instance, uh, our first stop is going to be in Puerto Rico and we want to show like, okay, in Puerto Rico, they have some of the best soil out there. Well, we can grow a sustainable way of eating because what I want to show is that there's a cycle of life where it's more than just going to Whole Foods and grabbing some organic tomato that you have no idea where it came from. It's more important to know kind of how things grow. What's the soil like? What has been done to it? Is there glyphosate in it? Is there the actual micronutrients and minerals that you need in soil that you know get absorbed in the plants? And then is there a way to be sustainable um, in terms of agriculture, but also sustainable in terms of growing animals, you know? Um, and then how do you bring that information to the people locally instead of having us buy food from Mexico in the winter? Like, how do we make it so that instead of um, having globalization of food, we get back to our roots? Something very similar to what Kimball Musk is doing, um, which is really driving the uh, uh, the knowledge at a local level, sustainable agriculture at a, at a local level. And that's kind of what we want to focus on in different parts of the country and then eventually different parts of the world. So are you going to be doing local initiatives or are you, you going to be kind of doing your own private practice still on the road and you focusing on content online? How are you going to split your time up? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I'm going to have to be superhuman, I think, to do this, but <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be a work in progress, but yeah, I'm going to scale down a little bit in terms of my day-to-day -day, um, practice and do more online content. Um, you know, I've been doing podcasts and work with uh, Jimmy Moore and um, really like the ability to scale and get information out to a larger audience because I think the thirst for knowledge at this point is as, as big as, as I've ever seen it. Um, and so I think right now we're poised to really drive the, the information out to the public, not only in nutrition, but also biohacking. So it's going to be more online content, videos, kind of allowing people to follow us in this journey and show that, number one, you can travel with little kids. But number two, you can actually expose them to a normal circadian rhythm, meaning get them away from, you know, the iPhones, the iTablets, get them outside, get them uh, dirty because I'm surrounded by a lot of people who are afraid of their kids being outdoors, you know, afraid of getting germs, afraid of getting into the dirt. And the reality is that our concern with germs and using, you know, all these products that are basically killing our bacteria are also contributing to our, our um, gut health being unhealthy and um, to arise in a lot of these bacteria that are resistant to all the antibiotics that we have out there. So it's kind of, twofold. One, it's for my children and my family, but also it's to kind of educate people, say, hey, this is possible and this is why it's important to do all these things. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons too why, I mean, going to a more scalable approach is you know, I did, actually did the math a few years ago when I was evaluating a monthly review process of, of my clinic and where I was at. And I realized that there was a, in my career, if I continue on the path that I was at, I'd only be able to help roughly 12,000 people in my lifetime, which, right. you know, it's, it's, it's a, a lot of people, if you were seeing them in one room, but there's billions and billions of people out there that could learn from the things that you do. And so that's when I kind of pivoted my entire focus to, to doing what I'm doing now, which is definitely not, not an easy thing to do, but, um, I applaud you for, for making that shift. I mean, we certainly do need still lots of clinicians and one-on-one -on -one help with people, but I mean, when it gets to a point where you assimilate so much knowledge, being able to teach your kids what, what's out there in, in terms of the world while simultaneously being able to, to help other people at scale is, is a pretty powerful thing. Yeah, it's definitely, um, as you mentioned, I'm sure I'll, I'll be giving you a call for some tips as I go, but, um, you know, it's one of those things where as health practitioners, you know, I think all of us go into it with the goal of really helping people. I truly believe that. And, and the question really becomes, what's the most time effective way to do that? And I've been able to connect with so many people, so many wonderful people on social media. And before all this, you know, I wasn't a very big person on social media. I'm, I'm a little bit older, I'm gonna be 40. So I didn't really grow up in the era of all, you know, Facebook and stuff like that. So it's new to me, but 
Well, the experience has been really positive in the sense that I've had so many people reach out and say, hey, you've really made a difference just listening to you. I've been able to kind of start diving into certain things and it's made a difference in my life. So I think that's really um, rewarding um, on a larger scale. Uh, so how do you, when you're looking at kind of, let's say you said that you're on a limited basis now where you're only working with so, so many amount of people. Let's say someone comes to you and they say, okay, doc, I want to go keto and you get them all that. You get their nutrition set. I think a lot of people listening to this podcast are looking for tweaks and, and things to optimize. And then they say, okay, now look, let's look at everything else that there is to biohack or to optimize. What are the first high priority things that you evaluate and measure or start um, looking at as far as their lifestyle? Yeah. So, um, a lot of it is dependent on the person, but I would say even within ketogenic, there's tweaks that you can make depending on your genotype, also your response to certain macronutrients. Um, but let's say we go beyond that. We have the nutrition dialed in. The next thing that I think is probably the most important thing is sleep. And so I really focus on people's ability to get sleep and I use the aura ring as a, a way to track them. Um, and I think that sleep, if you've ever had little children or if you've worked late nights, myself personally, I used to work late nights in residency, medical school and, and during practice. So I went about 10 years where I didn't sleep very well um, at all. So I probably had two to three hours of sleep per night. And if you look at a lot of the studies that are coming out in terms of the impact of poor sleep, not just um, – duration, but also the quality of sleep, meaning are you hitting deep and REM sleep or the different phases of sleep? If you're not getting adequate sleep, then the impact metabolically is significant, meaning that you have much higher levels of cortisol. You'll have suppression of testosterone, of growth hormone. Your appetite level will go through the roof. And so a lot of people will come to keto and say, well, you know, I dropped 30 pounds. I feel great. And then I'll stall out. Well, then the question is, are you addressing all the other things that are actually impacting your body? And sleep would be the, num the number one thing that I would focus on. So, and there are simple things that you can do. Yeah. This is what What's I was going to ask is, is, yeah. is what are the best things that people can maybe not, that they're not doing now that they can start implementing? Yeah. So very simple things that you can do. Um, and these are all kind of things that don't cost you a lot of money. So one of the things that I'm really focusing on is how do you actually biohack without spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars? Because you could do that, but not everybody can do that. And I don't think you need to. So in terms of sleep, simple things. So and probably the hardest thing is turn off your phone. So uh, two to three hours. I usually tell people three hours before you're going to go to bed, you got to turn off your phone. And that doesn't mean like, you know, you turn it, you close it and you put it next to your bed. That means you turn it off completely and you put it in a different room because, what we know is that melatonin, which is really the driver of deep and, and REM sleep, is suppressed by the blue light that's emitted by all these electronics. And so it goes from, you know, your iPad, iPhone, whatever computer you're on, but even the overhead lights. You know, we are um, noticing now that there is a disruption in our circadian rhythm and that every organ in our body has its own kind of circadian rhythm that is normal for it. But our body doesn't know what that is because we don't go outside anymore. So... Um, and, and we're always in artificial lighting. And so our body is confused. So when you have all these artificial lights on late at night, you're basically suppressing your body's ability to reach deep sleep. And so if you turn those off, dim the lights, get some lights that are not, um, you know, emitting blue light, make the room cold, do like a cold shower, drop your core temperature, um, get rid of the Wi-Fi. So cut off your Wi-Fi, you know, an hour before you're going to go to bed because all those things disrupt your ability to access deep sleep. I always use the example that the best sleep that I ever get is when I go camping in the middle of nowhere with no access to technology. And the reason for that is because you're back in your normal circadian rhythm. You don't have access to any artificial lighting and you sleep like a baby. So how do you, how do you incorporate all these technologies in your day-to-day -day life without becoming like a hermit living in the middle of nowhere. Nobody wants to do that. So you can do a simple, you know, biohacks like that and actually improve your health, sleep better, feel better, and get back into kind of your normal circadian rhythm. Got it. What are the top things that you do? Obviously you, you probably do the bulk of that, but any things yeah. that have shifted the game for you when you transition from the 10 years of no sleep to, to where you're at right now? 
I would say focus on the thing that's the hardest for you. So for me, you know, doing all these things that I just talked about have been extremely difficult because I have, I'm used to working, you know, nonstop and um, to, to slow down and say, look, I'm, I'm going to stop looking at emails. I'm going to stop looking at social media at a certain time. That's hard to do, but it's actually allowed me to really connect better with my wife, with my kids. Um, and so I always say to people, you know, really try to focus on the things that are harder for you. Um, I, I firmly believe that sleep, and I've seen this in multiple people that I've worked with, improving their sleep is dramatically impactful on not just weight loss, you know, reaching ketosis, but also their mood, their ability to maintain their weight, their hunger levels, all those things really come into play. Right. I think that some, the couple of the, the big things that switch the game for me, I think the biggest thing for sure also was setting a cutoff time and yeah. just, just being done with everything at 6.30 or 7.30. You usually had to make it just before dinner time and say, okay, I'm going to have dinner. Well, okay, done with everything. Shut the, shut the laptop, shut, shut the computer off, put my phone, phone in error, plan and do not disturb, and then have dinner and like enjoy that process. And then afterwards, mm-hmm. whatever I want to do, if it's, you know, play a game, if it's, um, do reading, if it's movement stuff, whatever it is, like that time after I eat, before I go to sleep is just reserved for non-work and non-social media activities. That's probably the, the biggest single thing that when I do that, I sleep better than when I do not do that. Very, very clear to tell. Um, yeah. And it's hard though in, in our kind of, especially when you're not a nine to five kind of person, right? So, I mean, you technically could be working 24 seven on your business and you know, your outreach to people. Right. So it's really hard to make that decision, but it's so life changing. Once you do that, you know, it really breaks you away from kind of the, what we now know is almost a, um, addiction. I mean, you can become addicted to technology. Um, so I agree with you hundred percent. Right. And then I think Two other ones. One was, is just having the room cold. Mm-hmm. Huge, huge game changer. So the colder I get, the better I sleep. And then two, uh, I mean, three would be eye mask. So even yes. when I have smaller amounts of light, even uh, uh, just a little bit, just an eye mask, just ha- nothing else other than like those three combos can really change my sleep markedly fr- from night to night. Yeah. And the other thing I would also mention is, I mean, in my house, I, I definitely have switchers so that the lights are very dim they're more of a um, magenta so you don't get the blue light exposure if i'm traveling which i do a lot i'll use the blue light blockers um so you look like the weirdo but it, it works tremendously and then i definitely think that one of the things that i'll do is i'll do a sauna and then i'll jump into an ice bath or a cold shower and it's that differentiation between temperatures that that's the best sleep that i i will ever get yeah um, so, so it's, yeah, as far, as far as the lights go, I have a, a timer on in my house. So we have uh, Philips Hue lights where you can time them on your phone and I put them, yep. at, I think it's seven thirty. with, they go all the way to the, the most, um, red light possible. And then they dim eventually until nine thirty, and they just turn off. Yeah. Yeah. I use those similar, um, and they're amazing because then you don't even have to think about it, but yeah, yeah absolutely. So what's up after sleep? So next thing I think, um, I mean, it's really dependent on the person, but I would say um, exercise is another big one that I really try to focus on with people. And and I don't mean necessarily, you know, being in the gym, lifting, you know, two, three hours a day. That's great, but that's not realistic for everybody. You know, we're so busy in our modern way of living that you got to figure out how can you really incorporate simple things in a short period of time. So I'll focus on, you know, hit exercises, but I also focus on just body weight exercises. So push ups, wall sits, you know, just handstands, simple things that people can do, um, planks, just so that you're really activating your muscles, getting your body activated because not only does it help from kind of a metabolic standpoint, right? It endorses or it, it boosts endorphins, you get BDNF, um, activation. So you're getting a lot of these positive factors by doing simple exercises and it could be something as simple as 20 minutes a day. Um, so that would be the next thing. And then, you know, I'm a big proponent of, um, sauna work. So, uh, definitely heat and cold thermogenesis for me is probably the next ones that I like to focus on quite a bit. Um, because I've noticed recently there's tremendous data out there showing the benefits of both. What, what are the big ways that you can incorporate this in your life? Because I'm having, so I do cold shower 
every day for sure yep. to end it with. But when I, so I split my time and I travel a lot, but between Austin where I'm right now and, and Brooklyn mainly. And w- when I'm in Austin, the, the water just doesn't get cold. So I, like I, I turn it to yeah. as cold as I can get. I'm just, I just sit here and I could take, I, it's like bath water to me. Um, right. Other than that, um, it, it seems to me to be very inconvenient sometimes to find super cold or super hot environments like a, like a sauna. I mean, I guess here I could just go outside. You'd be in Austin. Yeah, I could, <laughs> I could just walk outside. Um, right. What are the easy ways that you found to incorporate these things into your life or your patients' lives? Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, and again, you have to kind of figure out how you can incorporate um, these things. So sauna, I found to be a little bit easier in the sense that, you know, most people have a gym membership. Most gyms will have a sauna. I prefer an infrared, but obviously, you know, whatever you can can afford or actually um, use is probably the best. So if you have a gym membership, just doing a simple. So one of my favorite kind of routines would be, you know, waking up in the morning, you're fasted because you eat, you know, maybe at six o'clock at night. So you're essentially fasted. You go do a workout and it doesn't have to be two hours. It's like 30 minutes after that, jump in a sauna for 20 minutes, sweat it out. And now what you've, you've done is you've combined, you know, being fasted. So your glycogen stores are depleted. You've done your exercise and you've done your sauna work and you're, you know, ready to go to work or whatever. So you've kind of got it out of the way. Um, the, the cold thermogenesis, I mean, yeah, most people try to stay away from that. And that's one of my favorites, but I've also been doing it for like 10 years. So I've built kind of a tolerance and I know the, the feeling and, and I, I know the benefits of it. Um, if you're traveling a lot, I mean, I travel a ton and what I'll do is I'll just go to the hotel kind of ice bucket and just basically break the machine, just take all the ice. Um, and so I get a lot of weird looks cause I'm the guy who's going back and forth to the ice machine, but it definitely, um, is pretty simple and it works pretty well. Um, and then, so what are you doing? Are you just dunk it in the, the tub for a while or what is your protocol with yeah. cold thermogenesis? So let's say, I mean, if I'm traveling, um, and for a lot of people, I would just say, you know, fill up the, the bath with as cold of water as possible and then get into the bath itself and then dump the ice in. And I usually will tell people start with as much as you can tolerate. So three minutes, five minutes, whatever you can tolerate, start with that and then try to build up to it as, as long as you can. Um, and really, I mean, anything more than 30 minutes, you're not really getting as much benefit as you would, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so that's, that's usually how I kind of do that. You could do something as simple as, you know, cold showers, but you don't get the same metabolic impact from cold showers. It, it'll get you used to that sensation, but it won't give you the metabolic impacts. Okay. And so what are the main benefits for doing something like this? I mean, the cold is one of the biggest things for people that is <laughs> they, they get a trickle of cold water and they freak out. Yep. Um, so what is it that you, you use to motivate people as far as the kind of carrot stick to, to bring them towards cold exposure? I usually do baby steps. So I'll say, you know, do the cold shower, then just get some ice, put it in a sink with some water and just dunk your face in just to get that sensation. But then if you really go into the kind of metabolic impact, you know, most people are, are obviously interested in longevity, interested in the benefits of trying to live long, but also live healthy. And so when you start getting into the science behind it, well, cold thermogenesis does amazing things in terms of not only your mood, improving dopamine, improving norepinephrine, a lot of the neurotransmitters that you need to improve depression, anxiety, sensations like that. Then if you get into more of kind of the uh, mitochondrial impact, you get new mitochondria. And if you think about the mitochondria as kind of your battery cell, you want as efficient and as many batteries as you can for your muscles to really generate energy. And so what are you doing? Well, you're actually producing new mitochondria and you're making them much more effective and you're killing the ones that are not working very well. The next thing that really happens with cold thermogenesis is you're actually getting brown adipose tissue activation and decoupling. So when babies are born, they don't really freeze because they have this fat that actually is metabolically active and generates heat. Well, we thought that it would go away as you got older, but the reality is is it goes away because we're never in an environment where we're cold. And so if you're always in a 72 degree weather, well, you don't need that activated. But if you start doing the cold thermogenesis, well, what happens? You start activating this adipose tissue that 
starts generating heat. So you start losing weight, you start burning more energy all the time. And if you propose it to people like that who are really motivated to get down to a certain weight and get healthy, it usually sells itself. And, you know, obviously it's a process, but people kind of, their eyes get bigger when you say, hey, you could be walking around burning energy all the time. That usually works pretty well. So kind of fat loss as a, as a general benefit to, to keep people hooked? Yeah. Yeah. And I try to stay away from fat loss or weight loss because my focus is on kind of the metabolic syndromes, the, the getting, getting healthy metabolically and you will lose weight. So I try to kind of approach it from that perspective. But if you tell somebody, look, number one, your joints aren't going to hurt. Um, you're going to start burning more fat more effectively. You're going to get in higher levels of ketosis because you need to burn more energy. And if you combine that with a ketogenic state or a low carb state, you, you know, you're basically like boosting your ability to burn through it. I mean, that usually sells itself for people. Got it. Um, and then what type of, let's say, hormones, lab markers, things like that are you tracking an individual who just generally wants to improve their performance? Yeah, I track a lot of values. And so um, I'll try to simplify the ones that I think most people would be interested in. Um, so just starting off, I mean, basic, you know, chemistry, making sure renal function, kidney function, liver function is okay. And then once you kind of branch out from that, I'll do things like CRP, ESR measurements to kind of have an overall assessment of inflammatory settings. And then after that, we'll check insulin with the C-peptide because most people that I work with are pre-diabetic insulin resistant. So we really want to drive down those numbers dramatically. Everybody's concerned about lipids. So we do an NMR lipid profile just to make sure that, you know, there's not some abnormality that we have to be concerned about. And then I'll do things as, you know, thyroid function, which is a big one. And we kind of interpret uh, thyroid function in the wrong way. So um, not to get down to rabbit's nest, but, you know, thyroid function, we look at TSH. And if TSH is normal, we assume that everything else is normal. And the reality is you could have a perfectly normal TSH and have somebody who's clinically hypothyroid or hyperthyroid. And so I usually focus on that one quite a bit as well because it's extremely important for most people. Um trying to think of what else off the top, you know, I'll do a lot of continuous glucose monitoring with people. So, um, the benefit of doing that is you can assess people's response to different things. So how does stress influence glucose response? How does, um, something like dairy. So dairy is one of my favorite ones because a lot of people who go ketogenic, you know, they, they maximize their fat by doing dairy products. So cheese, you know, um, creams, heavy creams, things like that. But you can get quite a significant insulin response from that. And some people can get a very, very high stress response from it. And that'll be measured actually in the glucose on the continuous glucose monitor. So I've focused on that quite a bit. And then breath and uh, blood ketones. And lately I've been really more interested in breath ketones because I think it gives you a lot more data for people than just the blood ones. Um, so that's probably like a general um, good start for most people, I think, to track. And then we obviously can get into the weeds of, you know, more specific biomarkers. Right. What about, um, so you said yeah, you prefer breath. Uh, why is that? And, yeah. And can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. So, and, and I will say I prefer breath, but I do track glucose, blood, and breath ketones. And so when you're looking at blood, you know, obviously there's a lot of more um, ways to do that, but it's really just tracking a BHB or beta hydroxybutyrate. And it's, it's tracking a very, very small percentage of the overall ketone production in your body. Most of the energy that we use from fatty acids are actually not in the form of ketones. They're actually used, we, our organs mostly use fatty acids. So your fat stores get converted into fatty acids and we use that for energy. Ketones are a very small percentage, but when you start checking breath ketones, you're actually going to be measuring kind of the utilization. So I'm more interested in how is the body actually using the ketones and the fatty acids for energy, not just what is being produced, if that makes sense. So you can correlate the two somewhat, but the breath will tell you, look, you're in very, very high levels of ketosis. That's basically what you're burning. And you will see that essentially probably the best way to really track that is if you do like an extended fast, you will see you know, a significantly elevated rise in breath ketones, meaning that you're really actually using 
those ketones um, instead of just producing them and peeing them out. Another way that I like to use it is is with exogenous ketones because I'll have clients who will try to like just boost their numbers by taking any exogenous ketones and uh, you know you can kind of trick them that way and, and see that they're doing it. Um, so that's another kind of simple way to figure that out. But um, yeah, I think the more data, the better. But you have to kind of be able to interpret what the what the data actually means. Right. And so when you're doing the breath ketones, for example, um, are you having the patient track this over a very long period of time? And if so, what are they, what are you trying to learn from that? Or is it more so, okay, now you know that you're in ketosis, you're using ketones, this is what it feels like, this is what foods are modifying that level for you, and then you're good to go? Or is it something that you constantly are looking at? It depends on the person. I mean, most people that I work with are willing to, they're mostly going to be type A personality who really like to see the data as a way for them to reflect on um, what they're doing and what the actual results are. So what I do is I, I will track, let's say most people that I start with, you know, it'll take about a month for them to really be able to see those breath ketones rise because I don't start people on a fast. I'll start, you know, a transition from like a Western diet more to like real food and then get them into ketosis. And then you'll start tracking blood breath ketones and see a dramatic rise and then we can correlate that depending on what we're trying to do. So if somebody is doing ketosis more for a functional reason, let's say they have MS or they have cancer or they have epilepsy or they have a reason like metabolically to be in really high levels of ketosis, then I'll track the breath ones much more, uh, much longer. And I use a program called Heads Up Health, which allows me to really kind of track it long term. If it's more like, okay, I want to know if I've got into ketosis or if I want to know specifically I've made a lifestyle change and I want to know what the impact has been metabolically, then I'll start tracking breath and blood ketones a little bit uh, closer. But in general, most people, I would say a fasting glucose, fasting uh, blood ketone and a fasting breath ketone in the morning is sufficient to really give you like an overall understanding of where you are metabolically. Got it. Are there any people that you see do not do well on a ketogenic diet? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I do see people, some people don't do very well. Um, and a lot of times it's because there is an underlying issue. So a lot of times it's because it's undiagnosed hypothyroidism um, or they have a genetic kind of predisposition. They don't handle saturated fats very well because they're more of an APOE um, kind of gene genotype. So I would say in general, most people can do very well, but you have to be able to be open-minded enough to tweak it. And that's why I like the data because it really kind of helps me uh, kind of modify things. And as I mentioned before, so a lot of people will go to keto and they'll do it by, um, you know, doing very high dairy products. Well, sometimes that'll actually suppress your ability to get into ketosis. And so just kind of tweaking that a little bit and saying, hey, maybe try something a little bit different in terms of your fat percentage and they will feel better. Their inflammatory markers will go down, their insulin will go down, and then they'll be much more successful. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is, is certain people, especially now with the advent of a lot of the products like MCT, C8, C10, I'm a big proponent of those things, so don't get me wrong. I use them myself. But I do think that a lot of people can use them excessively and think that they're in ketosis but not actually lose weight, if right. that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And, and now what I think that you mentioned before is that there can be some genetic things that actually predispose you to not doing well on a ketogenic diet. And like you said, you can be APOE4, you can have a PPRA, uh, PP. AR alpha gene polymorphism. Right. Um, how would someone know without doing testing that, okay, this may not be working for me. Maybe I should look at some of this testing because this is something that I think people feel really guilty that they're not doing it. They get confused. Uh, right. Granted, it's a not a really huge part of the population, but people get really, really um, kind of, they internalize maybe not getting results as they're doing something wrong. Can you kind of just explain how somebody would figure that out? Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because you know, this goes back to like, um, it's really kind of part of the medical profession where we always assume that if somebody is not successful with what we tell them to do, it's their fault or they're cheating. And so I think that's kind of the basis why a lot of people feel guilty or like maybe I'm doing something wrong, but I don't want to ask. I would say the best way to do that besides getting a functional medicine doctor locally who understands 
what you're trying to do, um, that would be the first step, in my opinion, is get a functional medicine doctor or get a, you know, MD who really understands nutrition beyond just kind of the recommended um, guidelines. If that is not something that is accessible, because obviously not everybody is able to go to a functional medicine doctor or pay out of pocket, then the next thing would be to get a good resource. So like a resource like yours. I mean, there's a lot of really, really good resources out there uh, now. Somebody like Rhonda Patrick, who really dives into the details, you know, at a metabolic level and see, okay, well, you know, simple things you could do. Let's say you have more of the APOE um, kind of genotype. Maybe you should back off on the saturated fats and go up a little bit more on the monounsaturated fats. Little tweaks like that can be can make a big difference. Um, you had asked me earlier about different biohacks, and I didn't mention one that I would really strongly recommend to most people, which is fasting. So a lot of times what will happen is you could theoretically be doing the macros perfectly and even be making a little bit of ketones and you think you're in ketosis but you haven't actually burned through your glycogen stores because you're basically consuming enough calories for the energy that you need. Doing a simple, you know, 24, 48 fast or doing intermittent fasting, that can a lot of times really kind of drive people in the right direction and get them into ketosis and start kind of the process of being healthy again. Got it. Um, yeah, that's a, that's very, very helpful information. Um, what would you say the 10 of the percentage of people who maybe fall into that camp where they have to Traditional keto isn't really working for them, and they have to do some individualized approaches. I would say it's it's probably smaller. Um, I would say maybe ten percent. Um, okay. Which is it's it, pretty. It's pretty. I mean, keto's getting pretty crazy right now, and there's a lot of people getting into it. So it's it's actually I'd say pretty significant from an overall population standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I think you know you can almost get tunnel vision because you're surrounded by people who are in the same kind of network as you are. I would say general population, we probably are hitting about 4%, if that. Um, so we have a long ways to go. I do right. think that because it's so much different than any other kind of fad diet out there, because metabolically you're getting healthy and people are seeing that, I think it's gonna be long lasting versus something that's you know more kind of cyclical. But we still have a long ways to go to really kind of change the paradigm. Got it. Um, so other than that, you, you said, okay, lab values. Are you doing any other measuring? You said aura ring. Are you using like HRV? Or are you doing any other monitoring that's yeah. not with blood? And, and if so, can you just kind of mention the top ones for you on that? Yeah, so HRV is probably one of my favorite ones. Um, so HRV, heart rate variability, for people who don't know, it's basically a, a good way to measure your overall kind of autonomic system, how stressed are you. Um, and so just blanket, when you wake up in the morning, you can check an HRV and it tells you overall kind of what's your stress level, is your body really ready to tackle the day. Then you can get into more details in terms of, you know, exercise impact on it, dietary impact on it, you know, things like that. So I'll use HRV uh, measurements quite a bit um, using, you know, not only the Aura, but different um, kind of apps that are out there. What, what apps um, are you using specifically? Because um, I've been actually been toying around with it lately, too, and I find yeah. the UI UX on most of them are just absolutely horrible. Yeah, the one I like the best is actually Elite HRV. Yeah, that, um, that so I've, one I'd like the most, yeah. too. I, I've tried – basically, if I'm going to recommend something to somebody, I, I will be the first to try it and everything else first just to make sure. And so I actually spoke with Jason, who's um, the one who started Elite HRV, and their data is amazing, and they're actually coming out with a new product that's going to make it much simpler. Um, so I definitely track HRV on a daily basis because it, it really gives you an insight into the body you know, before it's too late. So I use it with a lot of athletes to prevent kind of stress injuries, um, getting infections. Cause if you push your body too hard and a lot of type A personalities will do that, you know, you, it's a good insight into preventative, um, measures so that people don't get sick. Got it. And, and are you using that when you're traveling? I, I noticed that when it, it's tough for me to, to stay consistent with it when I'm traveling, but I have tracked it and I noticed that it it gets so much worse whenever I'm traveling, even if I think that everything's good to go, um, which is just <laughs> astounding. Yeah, so it's amazing what sleep, what travel will do to you. Um, so I'm actually traveling right now, and, and I will track my data. And so, you know, last night on the Oura Ring, I had about five minutes of deep sleep. 
um, which was pretty pathetic. Right. Uh, my H, my HRV, you know, reflected that my HRV was in the twenties. Normally it's in the fifties. Did so, you, did you just check yeah. with the aura ring or where, how did you check the HRV? Yeah, I checked it with the aura and then I checked with the lead HRV. So I like to have as much data as possible so that I can kind of see correlations. Um, you know, the, the lead HRV really tracks it a little bit better in terms of long term. You know, the aura is basically just in the morning, gives you an overall estimation. Um, so, but I like to kind of compare them just to see if they're concordant, meaning that they're basically tracking the same way because that gives you some insight too in terms of Kind of overall how your body's doing got it um and so hrv definitely something and we did a podcast with uh i don't know if you know mike t nelson who is super geeked out yeah. on stuff that's super super helpful if anyone is interested in more about that um but other than that I, what about you know you, you talked about how stress can play a big role here how are you usually working with people to reduce stress and to to combat that yeah, so we talked about a few things already. So sleep, basically everything is kind of cyclical. So if you if you just try to isolate one thing, you're not going to be successful. So you have to basically attack everything. So attack nutrition, attack sleep. Stress for me, stress reduction has been something that I've really focused on. So simple things as, you know, meditation. Um, I've noticed that a lot of people who are more of a type A, it's very, very hard to just not do anything for five minutes. So, so what I'll tell people is wake up in the morning, don't check your phone, don't check your email, don't you know get online, just take five minutes and just take some deep breaths and try to meditate. I do that myself and I've noticed a tremendous difference in not only my sleep pattern, my hunger level, my uh, HRV measurements. Um, and so I'll do that. And then I've worked really hard on, on gratuity. As you mentioned at night when you kind of turn everything off and you have dinner. I do the same thing with, with my children and my wife, you know, we'll spend 20 minutes just talking about what are we grateful for, for the day. And I, and I've noticed that just disconnecting from everything, but reconnecting with people has been tremendously beneficial for me to just really drop stress levels. And you can measure that in terms of your heart rate, your blood pressure, you know, obviously the um, HRV measurements can reflect that. Um, but then even your lab markers will do that. So you'll notice your glucose level will go down. You know, your ketones will probably bump a little bit, all things being equivalent. Um, so everything kind of plays into becoming healthy. Um, and so that's another thing that I would recommend for a lot of people to do is just reconnect with people, have a dinner, you know, without, uh, having your phone on. Right. Uh, gratitude is one of these things that I, when I first heard about it, as far as something to implement to help shift stress levels in management of stress, yeah, I was very skeptical, of course. Um, and I was like, oh, there's no way, like, w like why would that change? <laughs> and then I started doing it where I just wrote down in the morning, because so I have a little uh, writing routine in the morning, five things that I'd be grateful for. And then I started doing yeah. it in the evening as well. And I noticed that it, it just completely shifted my perspective on the world throughout the day, which was profound. Um, so that's something that, that I was, I mean, it's, it's not like I am not grateful for things before or whatever. I just, I thought it would just be, uh, this woo woo kind of like how the same thing I thought of meditation before. Yeah. So we're doing it was, Oh, it's this thing that these weird hippies do. And you know, I <laughs> I just do, do that. You know, I might as well move down to Southern California and hang out and, um, it wasn't the case. It's the same thing with that. Like huge, huge difference when I started meditating um, with just my interaction throughout the day to control my emotions and, and my mood was profoundly different. Uh, what type of meditation do you focus on and how do you maybe get patience over the, the mindset gap of, you know, I think, I think there's so much baggage in the word meditation. I think that we should come up with a new word for it so we can kind of redefine it. Um, but how do you get people from, from this gap of, you know, the kind of have heard of it before and think it's weird to actually doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's usually one of the more challenging things. I'll, I'll approach it and say, look, I just want you to meditate for five minutes, and they'll look at me like I'm the craziest person out there. Um, so we usually get a pretty good laugh about it. But I always start with the simplest, most effective way that I think people can accomplish something. So I really tell people it's as simple as be in a, in a dark room, no connection to anything, close your eyes, sit in a comfortable position, and just, you know, let your thoughts come to you and let them go and just focus on your breath. So I am I would definitely say that when it comes to meditation, I am not an expert. Um, 
there's a lot of people out there that I would really say are probably going to be the definitive source. But I think it's it doesn't have to be something where you're a yogi, you know, up in the Himalayas, you know, practicing meditation. I think it can be as simple as just doing that. Just it's really about being connected with yourself, allowing your thoughts to come into your mind and just recognizing them, let them letting them go. And I've noticed that so sometimes I'll put people in like a sleep study lab and just track their brain waves when they do that. And you will see this amazing transformation in terms of the waves that are happening. And it allows people just to kind of decompress, let the thoughts go away. So it can be something, I don't think you have to make things super complicated for most people because what we have recognized is that if you make it super complicated, you know, people are not going to continue because it's too hard. So yeah. what do you, yeah. And, and, you know, unless you're like a billionaire who can basically have anything you want, most people can't do that. So how do you actually incorporate this stuff into your life? And it could be something as simple as going to Central Park, you know, sitting there laying in, in the earth and just focusing on the sun. I mean, it could be something very simple, just disconnecting. Right. And I think that there's tons of apps now that make it super easy too, where, you know, Headspace and Calm and many others, where there's a yep. daily, daily prompt, you just plug in, you do it. And that, that's how I got into it. That's how I know a lot of other people who got into it. Um, I mean, and just to be very clear and frank about this, I don't actually enjoy the process of meditation. It's, <laughs> it's, like, it's not it's painful. Yeah. It's not, it's not fun for me, but I mean, thinking about it like a workout, like I, I typically enjoy working out, but sometimes I go and I show up and I don't want to be there afterwards. I feel amazing and I know what it's doing for me long term. And that's how I think of meditation as well. It's like it, it's not necessarily a pleasurable thing where I'm unplugging and, and becoming one one with the universe and all this different stuff. I, I, I typically don't like it, but I but I know how it impacts the rest of my life. And for me, that's 100 percent worth it. And so for people who struggle with it day in, day out, think about it as doing like mental bicep curls, like you, you're training your brain day in and day out. And then that's what matters over time. And the compounding effort of that for me has, has made a giant shift in my life. Yeah. And it's one of those things, you know, like as humans, we're very good about kind of avoiding the things that are the most difficult to do. And I'm totally with you on this where it is extremely painful for me. I mean, I would sit there and kind of agony, but it's gotten better. And, you know, I don't think it has to be something like I mentioned where you have to do it all day, every day. And, you know, I think something as simple as just, as you mentioned, five, 10 minutes, just do it, put it in as part of your day and then just move on. And I've noticed for myself or a lot of people I work with that it's been tremendously beneficial, as you mentioned, in like their ability to deal with the rest of the day. So you could think about in those terms, like, okay, I'm going to have a better time today just because I'm going to spend five minutes on myself just trying to relax. Yeah, super powerful. Um, all right, Doc, I think that, one, I want to be respectful for your time, but two, I think that we've, yeah. we've thrown so much stuff out there for people to digest that I don't know if anybody would be able to cram anything else um, in, in their year <laughs> now. Um, so why don't you just give people a heads up on where they can find you and more of your work? Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm on social media. You can find me, Biohack MD. Um, idea of my personal, which is John Lemansky MD, but uh, I'm putting together kind of a site where a lot of the things that you and I were just talking about will be there. It's biohackmd.com, so check it out. And um, definitely enjoyed um, following you, and so it's been a pleasure connecting. Yeah, I'm going to be super excited to start following you and your family around uh, the world when you guys start traveling. Yeah, it should be interesting, that's for sure. All right, Doc, appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. But even if you didn't, I would love a review. Just go over to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcasts and pop in a review so we can get found by more people, get better guests, and have the information that you need. So please go to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcasts and leave us a review. And if you're new to keto, head on over to perfectketo.com slash podcast and enter your email for all our top tips and guides on getting started with the ketogenic diet. Thanks and we'll see you next time. Bye.